Good afternoon, and thank you for joining us today. Today, we're going to have a conversation with Dr. Jerry, uh, Carrie Johansson on oxygen and um, pulmonary fibrosis. Dr. Johansson is a clinical associate professor in the Department of Medicine and Community Health Sciences at the University of Calgary. She's a director of clinical research for the ILD program at the University of Calgary based at the South Health Campus. She completed her medical training at the University of Calgary, then a clinical and research fellowship in ILD at the University of Cal California, San Francisco, and McMaster of and a Master of Public Health degree in Environmental Health Studies at the University of California, Berkeley. She's been working at the South Health Campus since 2015. Research efforts focus on understanding the relationships between environmental and occupational exposure and ILD, the role of oxygen therapy and improved diagnostics for ILD. May I present you Dr. Carrie Johansson. Hi, Sharon. Thanks so much. Um, so maybe I'll do my, share my screen now. Let's start with the presentation. So hi, everybody. Um, thanks so much for coming today and for giving me this opportunity to speak with you all about um, oxygen and oxygen use in interstitial lung disease. Um, th this uh, it's an issue close to my heart. Um, I find it's very challenging sometimes to get access to oxygen for my patients. And I think it's a really important part of our, uh, our therapy for, for patients with interstitial lung disease. So uh, these are my disclosures. I don't think they have uh, any relationship with oxygen or any of what I'm gonna be talking about today. So the outline of today's talk, what I'm going to go through it's a little bit just about interstitial lung disease. Um, you know, why people with interstitial lung disease uh, get uh, low oxygen levels. I'm gonna keep this very broad. I know there's quite a range of, of people um, watching. And so um, to try to keep this applicable, mostly focused on uh, patients with ILD and caregivers and understanding in a clinical sense what we're doing. So I wanted to focus a little bit on clinical tests that we order to measure oxygen. I'm going to talk a little bit about the impacts on your body, what we call hypoxemia. So hypo means low, low oxygen. What we think are some of the benefits of supplemental oxygen. I'm going to go through some of the studies that have guided our decision making and when we recommend oxygen. Obviously, some of the downsides. I'll talk a little bit about funding and funding access um, in a Canadian context and some clinical tips for using oxygen. And then we'll have some time for questions after. I want to emphasize, I'm not going to be talking today about the practical uses of oxygen. I think, I think there have been some sessions um, where maybe uh, there have been, I think some of our nurse clinicians and navigators um, that have maybe gone through some of those details. Um, and I know these are frequent questions that my patients ask and I will often defer those to um, our, our nurse clinician in our clinic, Kirk, who can answer questions about you know, liquid oxygen and combining tanks and um, sort of the practical day-to-day -day uses. But so I'm not gonna focus on that today. Um, I think that would be a whole other talk in and of itself. But I'm really gonna go through sort of why and, and when we recommend it. So these are data from the survey from the Canadian Pulmonary Fibrosis Foundation that surveyed Canadian patients and caregivers. So 640 people across Canada. Oxygen is a, um, was a frequent uh, topic of discussion. So, you know, 44% of patients that filled out the survey are receiving oxygen. You know, a caregiver said getting oxygen would help her, but it's so difficult to get. People aren't sure what their oxygen level should be. You know, it's frightening to be monitoring, monitoring your, your loved one's oxygen levels and worrying if it's getting too low. And of course, oxygen therapy is hard to access due to out-of-pocket costs, and uh, it's not paid for everywhere or accessible. So there are a lot of issues. This is obviously a really important topic, and I think one that deserves a lot of um, time and attention. So just as a basic overview of interstitial lung diseases or pulmonary fibrosis, I'll, I use ILD as a sort of blanket term for the, for the interstitial lung diseases, some of which are fibrotic with scarring in the lung, and some aren't, but most of, most of them will have scarring. So I think of the lungs as a tree, and I think of the, uh, the airways as the trunk and the branches, 
And the leaves, this is why, you know, what I went into interstitial lung disease. The leaves is where all the interesting stuff is happening, in my opinion. <laughs> the airways deliver the air out to the leaves, which is where gas exchange and a lot of the metabolism of uh, gas exchange growth and remodeling takes place. And so the interstitial, so airways diseases like asthma, COPD, bronchitis, those are the airways. Those are the trunk and the branches. The interstitial lung diseases are diseases of the leaves. And that can be over 200 different uh, processes that can lead to scarring of the lung. So it's a large group of disorders. Uh, not all of them progress to lung scarring, but many do. And they're also um, sort of synonymous with the term pulmonary fibrosis, you know, pulmonary meaning lung, fibrosis meaning scarring. So why do patients with interstitial lung disease get hypoxemia or low oxygen? So we break it down from a physiology perspective. There's a few different things going on. There's a diffusion problem. So this is when we measure on a pulmonary function test, the diffusion capacity, which is like the cheek puffing test. That's measuring how easily oxygen get, gets from the lung across into the bloodstream where it needs to be. And when it's um, thickened or scarred in that area, oxygen can't get across and that's a diffusion problem. We get ventilation perfusion mismatching. So Blood and air have to go to the same areas in order to be efficient for gas exchange in the lungs. But in scarring lung diseases, they're not matching to the same places, and so there's an inefficiency. And then we can get vascular abnormalities, so all these blood vessels that are coursing through the lungs can get thickened, um, and it can make it harder again to diffuse the oxygen across into the bloodstream where it needs to go. So hypoxemia or low oxygen in interstitial lung disease, it's much more severe than in other forms of lung disease like COPD. And a lot of the data and studies that have been extrapolated to guide oxygen use in ILD have been extrapolated from diseases like COPD or you know, smoking related emphysema because those are very common and they've been well studied. But it's actually um, a very different physiology and it's much more severe we find in ILD. So how do we measure this? So these are some of the clinical tests that we use to measure oxygen levels. So pulse oximetry would be the most straightforward, probably most commonly applied. Um, it measures the oxygen uh, saturation on your red blood cells through, um, through your pulse. And so a normal reading would you know, usually be over 92%, 92 to 100% we would consider normal. The thing for pulmonary fibrosis patients is that it's almost always normal at rest. Not everybody, of course, but um, most patients, especially early on in disease, will have normal readings, 92% or above at rest, but it's uh, with activity that it drops. So this is why we do this six minute walk test. And it was designed to be six minutes because um, in prior studies, you know, years ago, it, uh, it was shown that how far people walked in a six minute time period was associated with different clinical outcomes. So, you know, sometimes for oxygen titration studies in the clinic, we'll just have you walk for like three minutes just to see if, you know, if the oxygen level is going up and down. But the standard test that we do certainly at baseline and then often in follow up uh, visits if people are not yet using oxygen is to do a six minute walk test. So it's a standardized test. There's supposed to be very standard level of coaching. You know, the, the person conducting the test isn't supposed to be like, come on, go faster. It's supposed to be very like um, objective. And you walk back and forth a certain distance. And we measure the distance walked. And then there's a percent predicted based on your age, sex, and height. Um, but what we're particularly interested in as ILD clinicians um, is how low the oxygen drops during that walk test. Your oxygen in normal, healthy, uh, lungs, your oxygen should not drop during exercise. Um, there's some variability in the, in the you know, probes, so if it drops more than 4%, we would say that that's an abnormal drop. What we do at our center, and uh, I think most centers do this, is we stop it if you drop below 80% on that finger probe for more than a minute, because we're worried that that's dangerous. The other test that's sometimes done is an arterial blood gas. Uh, and this is a a poke in the radial artery to measure arterial oxygen content. So here the numbers are different. And what we're measuring is like a millimeters of mercury of arterial oxygen content. So, so the SpO2 or the finger probe measurement is like a you know, 90 to 100% kind of thing. The, um, the measure on here uh, would usually be you know, 60 or 70 millimeters of mercury. So those numbers are completely different. They're me measuring different things. It also measures your carbon dioxide content. Uh, we can tell, you know, if people are uh, smoking cigarettes, we can measure that by the, carb um, the carbon monoxide level or if, you know, there's a risk of carbon monoxide poisoning. You can get a lot of information from that. We only do them 
in these situations if we're worried that somebody has low resting oxygen and that's to get uh, funding access for oxygen. So a lot of the funding access algorithms or pathways in Alberta, I can say for sure we need to demonstrate that somebody does or does not have resting low oxygen. And, and the most accurate way to measure that is by, by getting an arterial uh, blood gas. So I, I don't like these. Um, if we don't need to do them, I wouldn't want to do them, but we have to do them as part of our funding algorithm currently. We'll also sometimes do sleep studies. So, we, you know, we forget about it sometimes, but you know, you're breathing during sleep and if your, your oxygen drops when you're active, we think of sleep as being a restful time, but it's actually quite sympathetically driven. So um, people can have actually very active physiology during sleep. People can also have obstructive sleep apnea where your throat, you know, closes off and then will open again um, once you wake up a little bit and then take a full breath. So we'll sometimes do sleep studies to look for obstructive sleep apnea, uh, obesity hypoventilation syndrome, which is usually uh, in patients who have a body mass index 30 or higher, so a large abdomen that when they sleep, they can't take a full breath in. We'll look to see if people's oxygen um, drops or desaturates during sleep and can inform whether or not you need oxygen when you're sleeping. So those are some of the tests that we'll do. Um, there's different types of hypoxemia. So there's isolated nocturnal, which is when um, your oxygen really only drops when you're sleeping. Um, you can have exertional or ambulatory, which is most commonly what I see in ILD patients, where it's completely normal at rest. And then when people get up and walk or move, go upstairs, um, the oxygen drops. And then people can also develop low oxygen at rest, which is the most severe form of it, where you would need oxygen even when you're not doing anything. So it really is a marker of disease severity and progression. We worry that if somebody had a normal oxygen level with activity and now their oxygen level is dropping, that's a sign that something's wrong or things are getting worse. Um, and we think that people will start from sort of a normal oxygenation and then as the disease progresses, will develop exertional or ambulatory hypoxemia, so only with activity. And then as things worsen even further, it can go on to develop resting hypoxemia. So it's kind of a graded path. So why is this a problem? So if any of you, you know, on oxygen at home or watching this, um, you know, low oxygen makes people breathless. We call this dyspnea uh, in the medical, medical terminology, same thing as breathlessness. So, so it's uncomfortable and it limits what you can do. It is associated with increased cough. So um, having low oxygen will make your body's natural reaction is to breathe more. And as you breathe more and faster to try to improve your oxygenation to your body, it can trigger cough in patients with fibrotic lung disease. It impairs exercise tolerance, so you're not able to do you know, your usual activities of daily life. During exercise, this has been very well documented in physiology studies, it lowers the exercise time, the endurance time that people can exercise, and then the workload that people are able to achieve. So you're not able to do as much. It can put strain on the right side of the heart um, and can lead to uh, right heart dysfunction or what we call pulmonary hypertension. So supplemental oxygen use uh, in interstitial lung disease, it's often needed early in ILD. This isn't an end stage problem. Um, because of the, the abnormal physiology, um, you know, it's not necessarily a sign that things have gone to end stage. It's certainly a sign of disease progression or change if that didn't used to be the case, but it's, but it's um, frequently needed early on in disease. And why we recommend it, our goals as, as physicians to recommend this is to make people feel better. So we want to alleviate symptoms if we can of breathlessness, fatigue, and cough. We want to improve people's quality of life so that, so that patients are able to do what they want to be able to do. And then to improve exercise tolerance because um, as the disease gets worse uh, and as people feel worse with activity and exercise, the less they're going to want to do because it's uncomfortable, eventually the less they're going to be able to do. And so once you get into like this cycle of um, losing endurance and exercise tolerance, tolerance. Um, you know, it's kind of a slippery slope, and so we're trying to preserve endurance, strength, and uh, exercise um, duration. And we just know, like, there's just something really obvious about this, even though we don't have a whole lot of good studies in this field. Low oxygen can't be good for people. Like, you know, I think as physicians, when we've gone through being on call in the hospital, you will get paged in the middle of the night. 
if somebody's auction is dropping to 80% because everybody knows that's not good. Um, so there's something about like the fact that we need to provide all these data to show that this isn't good. That's always been a little bit surprising to me. And I think some of my colleagues that we, we know that low auction can't be good for people. So, so I think we have to try to find out um, who's going to benefit the most and how to use this appropriately to gain the maximum benefit. So really, you know, there's a, a lot of different studies. There's really good data to show that there's a benefit to using oxygen during exercise, especially if your, your oxygen is dropping with activity. So there's been many small studies. These aren't large randomized trials. Although um, Chris Ryerson's team at the University of British Columbia has a large exercise study with oxygen ongoing. Um, and we hope we'll have those results in the next two to three years. But we know that when used during exercise, oxygen improves your endurance time. So how long you can exercise, walk distance, um, when people have been randomized to do a six minute walk test without oxygen and then with oxygen, they walk further. It can alleviate breathlessness, not entirely. And that's kind of a, breathlessness is a complicated symptom. So it doesn't necessarily get rid of it, but hopefully it can improve it for some people. It improves the efficiency of oxygen uptake to the muscles and it improves the overall workload. And while, you know, the goal is to, um, you know, one of the goals is to uh, allow people to be able to do their activities of daily living without being limited. One of them also is to get the maximum benefit from exercise. So when people attend pulmonary rehabilitation programs, if they didn't have oxygen, they would only be able to do a certain amount of workload. With oxygen, they can do more so that they can get more out of the, um, the exercise that they're participating in. Um, so this was a study uh, from one of my colleagues and friends, Dr. Kaur, Yet Kaur in Melbourne, Australia, and they actually did a survey of um, patients and they wanted to look and find out if patient ex their expectations before using oxygen um, versus their experience after they'd started on oxygen. They did a qualitative study. So they interviewed you know, almost 50 people, some of whom were on oxygen and some of whom needed oxygen but hadn't started on it yet. And they wanted to understand what the expectations were from patients before starting on it. So these were the interview themes. These are their main um, findings. So on, on this hand side here, this, these are patients receiving oxygen and these are patients that were recommended to use it but were not using oxygen. And some of the common themes that came out of the interviews from the positive impacts of using oxygen was that it, it relieved some of their non-breathlessness physical symptoms. So probably things like cough and fatigue. Um, it improved their exercise tolerance, so their functional capacity. But one, some of the negative impacts of oxygen therapy was an unmet expectation for symptom relief. And when they got down into the interview um, details, it really was that it didn't alleviate breathlessness as much as they thought or hoped it was going to. It also had uh, significant lifestyle interference and physical restriction with using oxygen, which like nobody's surprised about it. It can be a major um, burden. And then the so psychosocial adjustment was self-consciousness for use in the community. So there were some mismatches of when people thought um, that it might be relieving breathlessness more, but it didn't, but it maybe relieved some other types of symptoms. Um, in these patients not receiving oxygen, things that they didn't reasons why they didn't want to start on oxygen um, and why they weren't using it, even though it had been recommended, was a fear of dependence or thinking that they might get dependent on it or kind of addicted to it. Um, oxygen being uh, basically like a threshold where now if you started on oxygen, there's a lot of fear that that signifies it's the end or that things have progressed beyond um, beyond return and embarrassment of, of sort of what it looks like um, and the perceptions. And one of the major expectations was that it would relieve breathlessness. And so, you know, it's been looked at in some studies because breathlessness is such a common, uh, it's a common symptom and it's very complex and it involves not only low oxygen, but it can also involve the mechanics of the chest. It can involve other comorbidities like abnormal pressures in the heart or heart failure. Um, and it can also involve sort of the perception and experience of breathlessness that just using oxygen itself doesn't necessarily relieve that. And one of the findings too that's been shown in studies is that people will push themselves to a certain degree of breathlessness. Um, and so whether it was not with oxygen, uh, they'll push themselves to a certain degree. And then when they have the oxygen, they will push themselves again to that same breathlessness tolerance. While they may have walked a whole lot further or done more exercise, 
the wall that they hit with their breathlessness is what um, is unchanged. So oxygen itself is not necessarily going to alleviate the breathlessness experience. Um, so this is the best uh, study that we have to guide um, the benefits of oxygen in an interstitial lung disease uh, group of patients. This was published two years ago. Um, this was a highly anticipated study in our field, given that we had been really extrapolating a lot of the, a lot of the data from, from COPD literature or from these sort of small physiology studies. Um, but this was done out of England. It's called the AMBOX trial. And so what they, they did was they, they um, randomized patients to either start on oxygen for two weeks and then go to no oxygen or start on no oxygen and then cross over to using daily oxygen. And these patients all had fibrotic lung disease, so pulmonary fibrosis of some sort. They had normal oxygen at rest, but they had desaturation or low oxygen with activity. And what the study set out to do was to find out if it improved quality of life in those patients. Um, and so they had this two week run in and then they had a crossover, again, either oxygen first, no oxygen, and they measured a whole bunch of different outcome measures. And so what this is showing, so um, the main results from this study, this is looking at um, a quality of life uh, survey, which is called the K-Build or the King's Brief Interstitial Lung Disease uh, Questionnaire. They looked at breathlessness, chest symptoms, psychological symptoms, and the overall score. And this is showing the difference between the treatment. And so zero, if it was down at the zero level, there would be no difference between no oxygen and oxygen but their breathlessness and activity scores improved significantly. Chest symptoms improved significantly. Psychological symptoms, there was a trend towards improvement, but it wasn't, didn't cross um, zero. And then the overall score was improved in the patients when they were on oxygen. So again, this one here is showing breathlessness and walking ability. Um, this is worse, same, or better, and this is on oxygen and on no oxygen. So breathlessness was worse with no oxygen. Uh, some patients uh, said it was the same with no oxygen, but most patients said it was better, um, as well as their uh, walking ability was better with oxygen compared to no oxygen. The other thing they did in this survey was they interviewed the, the study participants after and did like a qualitative study. So they had almost like focus groups and these were some of the benefits. So they looked for themes that came out of the patients, uh, the patient interviews. Um, some of the benefits, you know, they said freedom, being able to do things I haven't been able to do for such a long time. It made me feel less tired. It made me feel less breathless. My cough wasn't so bad. I could do things without having to stop. It taught me how much this disease has stopped me from doing things. Not because I don't want to do them. It's the fact that I physically, because of the breathlessness, can't do it. Another benefit that they noted, would it, it was definitely helpful because when I'm normally hoovering, so this is an English study, vacuuming, I have to take it steady or perhaps stop for a couple of minutes, but with oxygen, I could just do the whole lot. So using ambulatory oxygen indoors, you know, playing with the grandkids is the same. I can carry on with it. Before I would not have been able to do very much, but breathing is a lot easier. Um, and then some of the challenges, of course, that they went through, there's always going to be difficulties, you know, although you're benefiting from the oxygen, having to carry a heavy cylinder kind of defeats the object a little bit. I had to have a full health and safety risk assessment before I was allowed to take it into work. Then every time I left the office, I had to take it with me, so that was difficult. One patient commented, I just felt embarrassed for having these tubes running up my nose and from a tank on my back. If it was a pill, nobody notices it, but with a cylinder on your back and a plastic tube up your nose, it's much more visible. At the end of the road, you get given the oxygen. You think, because the last eight years I never had oxygen, but all of a sudden you get it and you feel, is it time to die? Is it time I'm going to go? It's that sort of feeling. So these were some of the quotes. Um, and actually, one of the interesting things, so even though these are definitely a part of the reality and what the, the patients commented on in this trial, 90% of patients that were in this study uh, went on to, they had the option to continue with the oxygen after, and 90% of the, them chose to continue using it afterwards. So, well, of course, there are these barriers. Uh, most of the patients felt like it was better to have it with them as an option, um, despite some of these limitations. 
So that was for two weeks at a time. So it improved patients' quality of life um, and some aspects of breathlessness and physical activity. But what about using it for like a year or two years at a time? We don't have those data. This is a study, this was a pilot study um, that was uh, just published. It was done in Australia, again, by Yet Core and her group in Melbourne. It was a randomized, blinded, sham controlled study. So this is interesting in that they're actually giving uh, patients tanks with medical air to carry around with them. Um, otherwise, it's actually, you would totally know if you were on oxygen or not oxygen. So that they're going to be completely blinded to whether or not they're getting the oxygen or not. In this pilot study, they recruited 30 patients that had exertional low oxygen. So it normal at rest and then it dropped with activity, randomized them to oxygen or medical air. And in the short term, this was a very short term study, they just showed that it, it was feasible to do this because they wanted to know, can we study this in a larger group of patients for a longer time period? There was no change in their six minute walk distance, but there was a trend toward improved cough related quality of life. So the cough was less severe, but that they were actually doing decreased activity. And this will be the first study. Um, so they've taken these data now and they're, they've developed it into like the full trial. And so they're going to be recruiting a couple of hundred patients to be following for a year um, to see what are the long-term benefits or potential downsides to, uh, to using oxygen in, in exertional hypoxemia. So based on, you can get the sense kind of at this point that we don't have a lot of big studies to answer this question of when we should be using it, who benefits the most. And um, you know what are the outcomes we should be expecting? So we actually did this study here. Uh, it was published last year. Um, this was Rachel Kim, one of our fellows, uh, who's now a pulmonologist here in Calgary. Oops. Um, and Chris Humphreys is a pulmonary fellow in Toronto. Um, and our goal was to to understand what do ILD experts uh, recommend around the world? So we did, so we actually, it wasn't just physicians, right? It was mostly physicians and a few uh, nurse clinicians who work in the field. We did a Delphi survey and the goal of the Delphi survey is to um, identify a consensus or um, you know, statements and approaches that people agree on. So I'm going to run through some of these. We, we had representation from 17 countries aiming to achieve consensus. We wanted to know when ILD experts around the world recommend oxygen for their patients. So when do they do it? Uh, why? What are some of the unknowns? And how does this fit in with current funding access? So this is what people agreed on. This is what these 45 experts agreed on. Um, that supplemental oxygen should be recommended for ILD patients with severe resting hypoxemia. So that is, if it's low at rest, we know from the COPD literature that everybody should be using oxygen 24 hours a day. People also agree that if it's, whether or not you're symptomatic, supplemental oxygen should be recommended if, the, if patients have exertional desaturation to less than 80%. So if you're fine at rest, but on a six minute walk test, it drops to 77%. It doesn't matter if you're breathless, it doesn't matter if you noticed it, we should be recommending that you use oxygen at that time because that's such a severe drop. It should be, um, everybody agreed that it should be recommended across different etiologies of fibrotic interstitial lung disease. So there shouldn't be one criteria for idiopathic pulmonary fibrosis and then different criteria for people with connective tissue disease or autoimmune diseases. It should be the same because we know that fibrotic lung diseases have similar features. Um, the other one, the other bottom one here, everybody agreed. So a score of two meant that everybody agreed to disagree on this one, not to disagree. Everybody thought that we shouldn't do this, that we shouldn't, um, we shouldn't advise people to use oxygen during sleep without testing to see if your oxygen actually drops during sleep. So a score of two was that everybody said disagree on that one. We should be testing people to see if they have uh, low levels of oxygen when they sleep. So the next section focused on goals of supplemental oxygen. So basically these said, and, and all of the respondents, this, and a, a score of four was agree. So everybody agreed that basically these were statements for them. These experts recommend supplemental oxygen to improve physical symptoms. So things like fatigue and decreased energy. We recommend oxygen to improve, improve psychological symptoms. So cognition and mood. We recommend oxygen to improve dyspnea, so breathlessness in our patients. We recommend oxygen to improve functional capacity, so exercise tolerance. We recommend oxygen to prevent deconditioning and to improve physiological parameters, 
such as oxygen delivery, cardiac output, how efficiently your heart is functioning. So everybody agreed that these are the goals and these are the reasons why we would be recommending this to our patients. A big focus, I wanted to highlight these ones here. So at all experts agreed that newer portable oxygen delivery systems must be developed to reduce the burden of use in patients with fibrotic lung disease. And we recognize that the current systems that are being used um, are burdensome, are heavy, the batteries can die, the tanks can run out, um, and that newer systems need to be, be developed. Everybody agreed that oxygen toxicity is not a concern in most clinical scenarios. So there, there are a few studies where um, they've looked at potential oxygen toxicity in um, you know, animals or mice. Uh, and I think that those studies are very specific and I don't think that they apply on a broad scale to most of our patients with fibrotic interstitial lung disease that the benefits of oxygen when your oxygen's dropping really low outweigh these theoretical risks and everybody else seemed to agree with that. The other thing um, experts agreed on was that the development of or worsening of exertional desaturation. So if on a six minute walk test, your finger probe number used to drop to 90 and now it's dropping to 80, that's evidence of clinical deterioration or something, you know, the disease is probably getting worse in patients with fibrotic lung disease. These were all the unknowns. Um, so a lot of what we don't know and what we don't know what to, uh, how we, use oxygen as a treatment and how we use it to guide therapy in our patients or to answer these really important questions. We don't know if it improves the survival of our patients with either resting hypoxemia or if they, or if they just desaturate with activity. I, you know, I, I wouldn't be surprised if it does. It would make sense to me because it would be preventing complications, but we don't know that. And I think those studies are, are really worth looking at even in a retrospective data so we can use that as, um, as good reasoning to, to guide the use of therapy. We don't know if it prevents acute exacerbations. We don't know if it keeps people out of hospital. I suspect that it does because I have a number of patients every year that are admitted to hospital because their breathlessness at home was so bad. But if we just had them on oxygen, that could have alleviated some of it. Other things we don't know is we don't know if, if people are developing abnormal pressures in the heart or impairment of their, their normal heart function because of the low oxygen. We don't know if, if intervening with oxygen will prevent the development of pulmonary hypertension or will slow the worsening of it. So all of these things are things that we, we need to understand better to guide our use of oxygen. We, every funding framework considers a threshold of that finger probe level. We wanted to get a sense from these 45 experts from around the world, what is the finger probe level um, at which you think we should be recommending oxygen? And interestingly, so this is the number of participants on the bottom, less than 80%, one person thought that that was an important threshold to be using. Nine patients thought that below 85%. The majority of, of physicians and nurses that answered this thought that if that probe is dropping below 89%, so 88% or below, or even below 90%, that that should be the threshold that we should be using to say, oh, my light did go off. <laughs> I guess I should be waving my arms more, sorry. That we should be thinking that if your auction is dropping somewhere below 89%, that is a red flag and that we need to be thinking, should we be prescribing oxygen now at this threshold level? And that's very different in Alberta. We cannot fund it for pulmonary fibrosis until it drops below 80%. And I'll get through the, the criteria, um, but most places around the world, I think that less than 89% is concerning and they would recommend it. So this was getting at whether or not um, you know, we used the original the data that we gathered in the study and the people that answered in this study basically said somewhere between, if your oxygen is dropping somewhere between 85 and 89% uh, with symptoms, you should have oxygen recommended. And we wanted to know, okay, that's great. Would you get it funded where you live uh, in these scenarios? So I can say here, isolated exertional desaturation, oh, sorry, this was one here. Um, to below 80%, yes, I could get that funded here. But it has to, um, there's still a bunch of steps to, to go through. 
but um, you know, 10 or 11 patients would not, or sorry, 10 or 11 participants, so that's 25% of respondents, would not get it funded if patients were asymptomatic. So the worst case scenario for exertional desaturation is dropping to less than 80%, and people are breathless or they're fatigued, most places um, can get that funded so that the auction will be paid for, but there's still about four of, the four of the respondents here so that they wouldn't be able to get funding. And in severe resting hypoxemia, so if your oxygen is really low or dangerously low at rest, not everywhere can get that funded uh, to, to give oxygen to their patients. And in that case, patients would have to pay out of pocket. So there's definitely a discrepancy uh, between what, what we think um, should when auction should be recommended and prescribed or at least discussed in a in a um, discussion of what the patient's preferences and values are and whether or not you can get that funded so we came up with this algorithm where we would think okay so how do we deal with this in clinic then so in our clinic we're seeing patients with fibrotic lung disease do they have severe low oxygen at rest if yes everybody agrees we should recommend oxygen if no, we should be doing physiologic testing. So like a six minute walk test or nocturnal oximetry where we're measuring oxygen levels when people are sleeping. So we should move on to that. Um, if it's uh, dropping below 85 to 89%, so if it's dropping, then uh, let's say it's not dropping, then we should periodically reassess it. If it is dropping, are they symptomatic with it? Yes, recommend supplemental oxygen. Um, even if they're not symptomatic, but they're dropping below 80%, we should recommend supplemental oxygen. Uh, if people have a, are having a desaturation with activity below 85 to 89% and they're not symptomatic, you know, we should think about it and we should discuss that with patients and maybe have a trial of oxygen and say, well, you might not be noticing it, but when you use oxygen, do you feel better? Are you able to do more? Um, because people, people might be surprised at um, how much better they feel with it. But we would like to have these options to discuss this. And I'm gonna, so and I really wanna highlight that this study that we did focused on clinicians. And so as the physicians or the nurses that are providing clinical care, and I just wanted to say, read this part. This, the current study focused uniquely on healthcare providers' opinions regarding indications and goals of oxygen for patients with fibrotic lung disease. We wanted to understand the recommendations being made by clinicians, as this is inexorably related to how information is presented to patients. The discussion of benefits and risks or complications can influence a patient's decision to accept or decline a treatment and share decision-making models. In the absence of definitive evidence, we hope that our findings can provide a framework. So when I say, you know, when I go back to these studies and I say we would recommend, um, we're never going to, well, hopefully, we're not going to tell people that they have to use something. What we're going to do is say, based on the data and the understanding um, of the physiology and the potential complications and the anticipated benefits, this is what we're going to recommend. And of course, that's always going to be a shared decision-making model. Um, I certainly don't practice in a way where I tell people what they must do. Maybe I should more, I don't know, but patients can tell me after. Um, but I've worked, you know, throughout my training, I've worked with uh, so many different people and can see that how you present the benefits and the risks can really influence how a patient and their family or their caregiver will take that data and make an informed decision. So what I hear a lot in Alberta is because we can't prescribe oxygen for our patients unless it drops to less than 80%, I will hear people say, oh, you don't need oxygen because it's only dropping to 81%. And I'm thinking, I, I think they actually do need it. We just can't access it. I think they would benefit from it, but we can't get it funded. So there's, so there's a very big discrepancy between what um, we say people need um, and what we actually are saying is it won't get funded at that level. So the takeaway message from our study uh, was that supplemental oxygen should be recommended for patients with fibrotic interstitial lung diseases in cases of severe resting hypoxemia, so it's low at rest, or exertional hypoxemia, particularly with attributable symptoms or exercise limitations. And of course, there's, you know, we don't know who benefits specifically, how this relates to the development of cardiac complications, or if it improves survival or keeps people at home or out of hospital longer. But I think this pr provided a bit of a framework for, uh, for future studies. So um, as I mentioned before, there are a few other studies coming. There's the HOPE IPF trial, which is the oxygen in pulmonary rehab study. Um, Chris Ryerson is uh, 
leading out of UBC, so that will be coming. We'll have the study out of Australia um, with the randomized trial, and then we're going to have soon a uh, clinical practice guideline from the American Thoracic Society um, making clinical recommendations for oxygen use. But until those come, what I've presented to you now is basically the bulk of the data that we have uh, that guides when, when we think oxygen would be a benefit and how and when it should be used. So having said that, I focused on, you know, the benefits and, and the goals. You know, I'm Listen, you know, I should have made like a couple of pages for the downsides of oxygen. I want to acknowledge this and recognize um, that oxygen is, is a burden. Oxygen use, it's, it's heavy, um, it's unwieldy, there's a tube that you can trip on, you're connected to something all the time, it, it can run out. Um, so yeah, there's a lot of downsides. And I know that it makes, you know, I've read studies, and I don't want to say this, but put words in anybody's mouth, but my patients have said it to me. And when I read through studies where people say, it makes me look old and infirm. You know, I'm 68 years old. I'm not, I'm not an old person. But this makes me look like I'm old and sick. And I don't like how people treat me or how they're going to perceive me. And, you know, that's very real. I think that's a tangible concern. As I mentioned, there's this fear that once you start on oxygen, it's crossing a threshold of disease severity um, that is, is a very meaningful threshold for people living with this disease. Um, I just learned this term, range anxiety, and it's, uh, it's from like, um, like Teslas and electric cars that you're going to run out of battery. But it's a very real fear, I think, when you've got um, a life, uh, sort of a life preserving device with you oxygen and the battery can run out or the tanks can go empty and how much anxiety that can cause for how many hours you have if you get stuck in a traffic jam or you get trapped somewhere like there's a very tangible fear. Um, people get nosebleeds and nasal congestion, it's noisy, it, it's, uh, it's expensive if you're paying out of pocket for it and of course it's flammable um, so if you're using a gas fireplace or you know we obviously recommend that people don't smoke with it, people have had explosive um, complications from, from flames with oxygen. So there's definitely not a lot of downsides. Um, and hopefully, you know, better devices will be developed. Uh, I don't know that we're in a position to do that. I think we need to collaborate. There's a lot of patient advocacy organizations that are advocating and funding um, collaborations with engineering groups to try to develop more efficient ways of delivering oxygen. So based on all of that, the current guidelines in the interstitial lung disease community, so we base a lot of our clinical care on expert consensus guidelines. And so the most recent guideline for IPF, or idiopathic pulmonary fibrosis, recommends rest, patients with resting hypoxemia should have oxygen uh, if their finger probe level is below 88% at rest. And that we should consider using, um, this, was, sorry, this was from a British Thoracic Society guideline, that ambulatory oxygen for IPF patients who are breathless, mobile, who desaturate with exercise, and whose exercise or symptoms improve with supplemental oxygen. So again, that was focused only on IPF. This other more recent guideline uh, applied broadly to interstitial lung disease patients of all etiologies or all different diagnoses. And this was a guideline for home oxygen in, in uh, the UK. So they recommended uh, that oxygen for ILD patients with severe breathlessness should be considered for palliative oxygen, but that ambulatory oxygen should not be offered routinely to ILD patients without resting hypoxemia. So this is where, like, okay, well, this is where we need to do the studies and create some sort of framework because that's the whole other group of in between who are fine at rest um, but, and maybe are not palliative or end of life, um, but who desaturate with, with activity. Uh, so this was a table that we had made um, a couple of years ago, and it's hard, I will tell you, it is really hard to find this information on, on provincial government websites and to kind of, it's been hard enough in our own province to figure out what the criteria are, um, and that they change sometimes with or without input um, from us or sort of being alerted. But we wanted to see how do we get oxygen funding for our interstitial lung disease patients in Canada with a focus on the fact that most, most of our patients have normal oxygen at rest. And these are the resting criteria. This, is mean, this means the people that have, um, when you check their oxygen at rest, most of our patients have exertional desaturation. So in Alberta, it's actually pretty common. These are all the COPD criteria. So you have to have a, a poke in the wrist with an arterial blood gas that shows a low level at rest. 
and basically all of these provinces, and then we compared it to the United States Medicare system, everybody basically had the same criteria, and this is extrapolated from COPD. The problem with ILD is that this does not apply to most of our patients, I would say maybe 5%. The exertional criteria uh, is where it seems to apply to interstitial lung disease. So in Alberta, um, you have to have a finger probe drop to less than 80%. And then you have to show that your uh, breathlessness or your walk distance significantly improves um, with oxygen. And so there's a whole, like a blinded walk test that needs to be challenged. Um, in British Columbia, it just needs to drop below 88% on a walk test, same in Saskatchewan. And it needs to, they need to show that it improves um, with the supplemental oxygen. Nova Scotia has a similarly difficult one as Alberta, where you have to go below 80%, which is really low. Prince Edward Island, uh, when we had reviewed this, had no exertional funding. So no matter how low it goes or how symptomatic you are, if your auction is normal at rest, uh, there's no funding pathway and you would need to pay out of pocket. And the same at that time uh, for Quebec, and I'm not sure if that has changed actually since this was from about two years ago. But you can see that it's different province to province and it's vastly different. Like less than 80% is crazy low. Um, compared to less than 88%. So that's a significant difference. Um, and then, you know, some places not having any, uh, any funding at all. So this is our, this is just like a snippet of the criteria for, I'm not going to go through all of this. There's like multi, there are multiple pages of documentation for how we can get this funded for our patients. Um, and I think there's probably similar complexity in each province, but in Alberta, we, we have to do a walk test. Um, and this has it's, it's been suspended during the, the pandemic to simplify this, which we've been very thankful for and has made it a lot easier for our patients. Um, but on a six minute walk test, the, the finger probe has to drop below 80%. And then we have to do a, an arterial blood gas to show that it's normal at rest. You can't be have you can't be very obese, so your body mass index has to be less than 37. Otherwise, you have to have a full sleep study, like an overnight sleep study at a hospital, for whatever reason. And then you have to challenge a walk test at a different site a couple of weeks later, where they walk you again with oxygen and without oxygen, but you don't know when you have the oxygen um, to decide whether or not you get funding. Uh, and then if you don't get funding through that model because of whatever reason, um, you can't challenge the walk test again for six months. Um, so so in my, it's, it's madness. It's absolute madness. Uh, and we have been trying to change this. And I'm very thankful. I think that we're going to be able to propose uh, some updated criteria based on the number of studies that have come out, showing how important it is to have oxygen for our patients, um, how needless some of these studies are, and that it has absolutely nothing to do with sleep disorder breathing uh, in most of our patients. So we think that this will simplify the pathway to getting oxygen. It will provide the opportunity for um, patients to at least try it and see if there's a benefit and not have to pay out of pocket. Um, and we'll probably actually make the whole process cheaper because I would imagine if you just did this, if you just offered it to people and they could find out if it was a benefit or not, it would actually be cheaper than going through this whole process. So I don't envy their job to create these criteria. I recognize how difficult it is, but it has created a significant barrier and we're hoping to um, simplify that for our patients. So these will be these studies that will improve access to oxygen, this ongoing randomized controlled trial of ambulatory oxygen, this guideline use, advocacy from patients, from physicians, from our nurse colleagues, from the CPFF and other um, patient advocacy foundations to simplify these algorithms because um, I think it's a really important part of treatment. So some of the tips I just wanted to briefly touch on here um, you know, oxygen is not addictive. Um, and I liken this to using glasses, like for vision. So, you know, if you needed glasses, but you really didn't want them because you didn't want to be, to be dependent on them. Um, you know, once you, the only real dependence on it is once you start using your glasses, you might realize how blurry everything had been for the past several years. And now you don't want to live with that blurriness ever again, but it does not have any, it doesn't weaken the lungs. Um, all it does is simplify and optimize oxygen delivery to your tissues to optimize your exercise tolerance, the efficiency of oxygen delivery to everywhere you need it to be, hopefully to alleviate symptoms. Most patients with pulmonary fibrosis don't need it at rest. I mean, some will, of course, but it's important to know that so that measuring that finger probe at rest 
uh, in ILD is insufficient and you actually need to have it measured with activity, activity that you're doing in your everyday life. It's helpful to have a pulse oximeter and you can buy them online. You can get them at um, medical supply stores or at, you know, uh, sort of pharmacy um, type stores. And you can also, also order them online just to have as a gauge. I don't recommend using them all the time because it can cause a lot of anxiety, I think, if you're tracking that, but it's good to get a sense. So if you go, if you walk your dog every day and there's a bit of a hill and you're really breathless at the top of it, it's worth knowing is your oxygen dropping to 75% with that, or is it dropping to 80%? Um, if, you're, if you're using oxygen, do you need to turn the oxygen up when you're doing that kind of an activity? So it's a helpful gauge. Our general guidance um, is that we we would like to keep your, your finger probe level higher than 88% at all times. So that's kind of a gauge. You know, it's not critical if it drops to 86 or 87, that's probably fine. Um, but the goal, and for using, you know, how do you titrate the flow rate, we would want it 88% or above at all times. So I'd say get a pulse oximeter, check with activity and not just when sitting. A lot of my patients will do their activity and they sit down for a minute or so and they check it and it's already like 90% and coming back up to normal, but it might have been down to 80 with the activity. So you can fly and travel with oxygen. Um, there are forms to fill out. You know, I filled them out for WestJet and Air Canada. I filled them out for international airlines for many of my patients traveling overseas. Not right now, obviously, in, this current, in the current times. But you can fly and you can travel with oxygen. There's just some paperwork that needs to be filled out beforehand. And um, I'm happy to provide those forms for my patients as long as they give me enough notice. And I'm sure anybody else is. So it doesn't have to be a barrier necessarily. Um, everybody's insurance uh, will be different if oxygen is a new therapy for you. So how travel insurance is impacted would need to be decided on a policy basis, case by case. But this doesn't need to be a barrier to you living your life and to flying and traveling. Um, you may need higher flows with more intense activity. So it's hard, um, and I recognize the barrier if it's across the room and you're about to go up the stairs and do you know, a bunch of bedding or whatever, that you have to get up, turn the oxygen up before you go and do that. But until we have sort of like a, an automated flow titrate, titrating machine, um, just know that whatever you're using at rest or with minimal activity, you just might need to sort of flood your lungs with more oxygen by turning that flow up before you do more intense activity, such as with exercise or whatever it is that, um, that makes your oxygen level drop. Then the other thing I think is really important to stress is that um, I think I, I speak on behalf of most of my clinician colleagues is that we really want this to work for you. So I have a number of my patients that will wear it when they're home and when they're exercising but they won't use it when they go out. And that's because of their, their appearance and that that's a value, um, a val that's, a, that's, a, that's a, a value that's important to them. And I respect that. And I want them to be as safe as possible and by minimizing complications as much as possible while making this therapy work for them. So I think um, that it needs to be tailored to each individual person to try to maximize the benefit and what you're going to get out of oxygen while minimizing the complications um, and potential um, adverse effects associated with having low oxygen with this type of lung disease. So, I mean, again, always you know, try to work, well, we should be trying to work with you um, as your care provider to make sure that this is working with you as best as possible. And then uh, I felt like there was pretty low oxygen at the top of this mountain um, in Kananaskis in uh, August. And I just wanted to share a beautiful view from Alberta just from last month. So I thank you all very much for your time and for coming. And I would be happy to take any questions um, that, that uh, Sharon will have for me here. Dr. Johansson, I think you've actually answered one of the questions because someone had asked the question of whether you can be addicted to oxygen. Yeah, and I hear that commonly. Um, and, and again, if there's, yeah, and I think I've kind of addressed that, but I think, again, it's, it's, um, it's a tool that's supporting your body. So it's definitely not an addictive um, and it doesn't, definitely doesn't weaken anything. If anything, it prevents the weakening of your heart muscle um, that can be under a lot of strain from oxygen. And I think, it's, and I think that, that glasses analogy, I'm sure there's many more, but I think it really is one of those things where you just start to realize that um, 
how poorly you might have been doing before you got it and how good you feel now. Okay, thank you. Our, our next question is, for the nasal um, canalier, are there many different types? Because uh, someone felt that they were really hard on their nose. Uh, so again, and I apologize, I, I'm, I'm sure there's a bunch of different types. I am not familiar with all the different types of cannulae that can, that can go in. I've seen different ones. I've seen sort of pokier with hard plastic, um, but I'm not, and then I've seen other ones that are sort of almost like a, like a little suction cup that kind of open more, more wide on the end of them. So there are different ones. I don't know how many different ones, but I think if there's difficulty with any of the equipment, your oxygen provider company, whoever, wherever you're getting your supplies from really, uh, needs to be a resource for you um, and I think you should be able to phone if somebody's having if something's uncomfortable it shouldn't be uncomfortable it shouldn't be painful ideally not causing nosebleeds um, but you should be able to reach out to them and have them provide you with options and I know where I work anyways they are all private companies um, and they provide different levels of service and they want your business and so you know we're not in any of the oxygen providing companies but I or sort of the oxygen, yeah, provision sort of delivery service. We're not affiliated with any of them, but I want for my patients to get the best service and the answers that they can, and making sure that all of their answers are, or questions are addressed. Um, so I think it's important to know that they should be there for you. And if you've got questions to really be making sure that you're getting what you need. Okay. Um, our next question is, can you, um, describe the different types of oxygen. How do you know which one you need? Yeah, so there's a bunch of different um, systems. Um, there are portable concentrators. And so a concentrator um, is exactly just what it sounds like. It takes room air and it concentrates it into oxygen. So it gets rid of the you know, nitrogen, um, the carbon dioxide, and then concentrates the oxygen level to deliver to you through the tubing. And it does that through some internal system. Um, and then usually they will be up to six liters per minute. So the way, so oxygen is delivered in a flow rate in liters of oxygen per minute. The minimum we would usually use would be 0.5 liters, sometimes one liter. You know, we can deliver it up to 15 liters in a high flow, um, in high flow tubing uh, and with, uh, with big tanks. So a concentrator doesn't have the capacity to deliver more than six liters per minute of oxygen. Most, and then the other, so there's, there's the concentrators and then there's tanks and you can get small tanks or big tanks. And the tanks are filled, they're pre-filled with oxygen and there's a pressure gauge on it um, so that you know how much is still in there, like in a PSI kind of thing. So you can have small tanks or big tanks. The big tanks obviously hold more, but are heavier. A concentrator can come um, with either pulse flow or continuous flow. And pulse flow is when you have to take a breath in and it triggers delivering the breath. Otherwise, it's not delivering oxygen. So it conserves the battery. Um, I, don't, I, don't think I don't think tanks can do that. I think it's just concentrators. So, so through pulse flow, it's just delivering it when you take a breath in. But for some people at low flow rates, if you're only using one liter per minute, that might be just fine when you're up and walking around. But it can't, they generally can't deliver more than three liters per minute um, in pulse. So if you're needing, if you need four liters per minute and you're out walking around, this is probably one of the most common things that Kirk, our, our Kirk Matheson, our nurse clinician, will be trying to help our patients with that are on oxygen in clinic. So they have a concentrator at home that can deliver a huge volume or a huge flow. So they can use five or six liters when they're cruising around their house. And then when, when they leave the house, because they don't want their battery to run out or they don't want to run out of a tank, they'll use a lower flow rate. And when they come in, their oxygen level is quite low. So a pulse flow cannot deliver the same amount of oxygen as continuous. If it's on continuous, it's delivering a continuous flow through that tubing to your body, more oxygen, but it will use more of the battery or will drain the, the cylinder or the tank more quickly. And so sometimes for people, it's a really, it's hard um, because that changes over time. So it may have been at the beginning of the disease onset, you needed two liters by pulse. That was plenty sufficient to keep the oxygen level at 90% while you were walking around. 
that it's possible that six months later, you're more breathless with activity and that we actually need to readdress whether or not that flow rate is adequate for you. And it might not be. And that now we need to have it on a continuous flow. So rather than using a concentrator, you might need to be using small tanks instead. Um, the other important thing to know is that there's different tubing. So there's clear tubing um, and that can deliver usually up to about, I mean, we kind of gauge it, but, you know, guesstimate it, but it's about six liters per minute. If you're using six liters or above, you need high flow tubing and that's usually the green tubing because the diameter is thicker. So you can get more flow rate through that tube. It's just like water through a, a, you know, a pipe or a tunnel. It has to be wider to allow more flow. So there's, um, so there's the concentrators that can do pulse or continuous. Continuous gives more oxygen per minute. And then there's the tanks that can provide continuous. I don't think they can do pulse flow. I have to check on that one. And then with the big tanks that can provide, they, you know, they carry lots and can del deliver um, higher flow rates for longer time periods and then the different tubing. So there's a lot to oxygen. Um, and I feel like there's a lot that, um, you know, when you're started on oxygen and we've, you know, in clinic, we've had a, you know, 20 minute or half hour visit, and we might have some time with Kirk to go through some of that. Um, it's, I think there's a lot of questions that go unanswered because it is a really complicated system uh, and there's a lot of intricacies and nuances to it. And we hope that some of that education and questions being answered is also being provided from the oxygen provider companies. Um, but I know that that's a huge gap for a lot of patients. Oh, and I forgot about liquid oxygen. So liquid oxygen, um, this is something I've been learning need to learn more about. And I'm sure if one of my patients is on here right now, he's like the oxygen expert, <laughs> then he could answer all of your questions about liquid oxygen. But that's a whole other form of it um, that can provide a large, um, a large volume in uh, a container uh, so that you don't run out for a long period of time. But not everybody, and I don't understand why, but not everybody seems to have access to liquid oxygen. And I think it's certain companies might have it, or I think it's expensive. So I think that they like maybe will offer that or provide it in certain circumstances, but I'm not sure beyond that. Sorry. Okay. Thank That's you. That's a really long answer. <laughs> Um, we've got another question for you, Dr. Johansson. One of them is, is exercise safe and do they need medical supervision to exercise? Such a good question. So, and you know, my, my multifaceted approach to managing interstitial lung diseases, there's the pharmacologic, you know, with the medications and drug treatments. And then there's the whole other aspect of infection prevention, oxygen when necessary, and maintaining regular physical activity. So exercise is critical and crucial um, for patients with interstitial lung disease. It, you know, in the absence of thinking whether or not they have underlying comorbidities, so if somebody has had like a heart attack within the last six months, obviously we need to think, is it safe for them to exercise and how do they get in, back into that safely? But speaking purely from the lung disease perspective, um, it's important. Uh, should be done regularly from an oxygen level. I don't want people exercising if they're dropping to the low 80s and they don't have oxygen. So I think that from a safety perspective, um, I think if you're dropping with activity, like even if you're on an, a treadmill or a common bike at home and you're measuring it and it's dropping to 82%, I find that to be concerning. Um, and I would recommend oxygen at that time. We're trying to get it so that it would be funded. But the goal would be to be exercising uh, and keeping your finger probe level at 88% or higher throughout all that physical activity. And this is somewhere also where the, the formal pulmonary rehab programs, I think, are really important. A lot of them now um, across the country have gone online. So they're doing them over Zoom or Skype. Um, I've had really good feedback from my patients. Um, they don't obviously, not everybody will have the same kind of equipment, obviously, that you would have in an in-person pulmonary rehab program. But two of the main, so they provide so many benefits, but from the safety perspective, our in-person pulmonary rehab programs would provide oxygen to patients uh, if it was dropping in below 88% with activity. So then they would be able to just give them oxygen while they're on the bike or while they're on the treadmill or walking around the laps um, to have it. So then the safety issue I didn't have to worry about. Plus, if you haven't been exercising and you're getting back into it for the first time in a long time, um, we're dealing with a progressive disease. You're worried about safety, that pulmonary rehab provides a, um, a supervised environment uh, to ensure safety and a sense of knowing what you can and can't do. So it should be safe. 
Um, I don't think people should be doing it if your oxygen is dropping towards the 80% level. That would concern me. I think in that situation, you should be either seeing if you can get access to oxygen where you live, um, or if not yet, then kind of modifying your activity so that it's not dropping that low, because I think the dangers of that are outweighing the benefits. Thank you, thank you Dr. Johansson. Um, there was a, oh, there was a question about uh, the cost of liquid oxygen. Someone on the, um, on the uh, webinar said that um, companies that are vertically integrated where a patient or sister company can provide the liquid oxygen, but it's also very expensive. So um, I think uh, you've just mentioned that as well. A liquid oxygen is very expensive. So how do you know if you need that versus just a regular oxygen? Is it because of the high flow or? Well, I don't think that it necessarily provides any higher flow rate. I think it provides more convenience. Um, and so that you don't run out and that it can be there and not need to be refilled as frequently. So I think it's more of a convenience level. Um, and if it's more expensive, then I guess that that's going, that as a resource is going to be used only for people who have a program or a plan that's going to be able to reimburse that. Okay. Someone also asked that O2 did not override their um, SOB. A sure, big disappointment. Bad. Yep. Um, I see zero info about how O2 affects shortness of breath, that the brain measures uh, CO2, not O2. And so the, uh, the, P, the SPO2 is raised by O2 delivery, but nothing helps expiration of CO2. So the shortness of breath still happens during recovery from efforts of exercise. Why the, why the limitations in the information? Yeah, that's a great question. And I went through some of that in the, the studies because we expect that it's somehow going to relieve breathlessness, but it, and it does for some people, at least some extent of it, and for other people it doesn't. And low oxygen is also a driver of, uh, it tells your body and your muscles actually, like your chest wall muscles and your diaphragm uh, to increase the respiratory drive. So it's not necessarily just the CO2 um, that will be driving a respiratory drive and that breathlessness is a complex, um, it's a symptom. So it's, it's a lot like pain where a lot of different things can be contributing. So the low oxygen can be contributing to breathlessness. Underlying heart disease is a frequent comorbidity in our patients. We see this if your heart is going into atrial fibrillation, so your oxygen is low and then your body is saying, well, how else can I deliver more oxygen? I'm going to increase my heart rate. And if you've got a tendency towards atrial fibrillation, you know, now your heart rate's going 120 or 130 in an inefficient way of pumping. That also contributes to breathlessness. The chest wall muscles and the diaphragmatic excursion. So, you know, if anybody's got a larger abdomen, that that can also contribute to breathlessness in the mechanics of the way um, that, it's, uh, that it's felt and perceived by the body. Um, and then there's fatigue and endurance and deconditioning contribute to breathlessness. So it's a really, um, oxygen isn't always going to fix that problem for a lot of patients. And we hope that what it can do is improve or prevent further deconditioning so that deconditioning related breathlessness doesn't get worse. Um, and that for some people it's just, uh, it might not do the trick for them for that overall uh, experience of breathlessness. Okay, thank you, Dr. Johansson. Our last question for you, Dr. Johansson, is someone want to know, um, why do they always feel like they have a runny nose because they're wearing their um, cannula? Mm -hmm. Yeah, and that's really, I mean, that's really common. I guess, um, you know, I think it's, there's the flow rate and the, the air can be cold and you can get vasomotor rhinitis. So if, you know, it's just got, like I just, I've always kind of assumed that this is the same as going out for a, a walk outside on a cold day and then you come in and your nose is drippy and we just call that vasomotor rhinitis. So the blood vessels are, um, they're, they're dilating and then they're contracting. When they're dilating, they're getting more leaky. Um, but having oxygen in the nose definitely leads to a lot of people having uh, a drippy nose or it can lead to a lot of congestion. And, um, and sometimes for people it can lead to nosebleeds as well. So I think that's just a sort of natural function of the, the temperature and the wind. And it doesn't impact every person the same, but it's definitely a common thing that we hear and we see with patients that are on oxygen, particularly if it's at a higher flow. 
is there anything you could take to eliminate this running nose? Hmm. Boy, I don't know. That, yeah, I guess one of the things that um, maybe you could try, um, would, so there's kind of an approach to these kind of things would be uh, a nasal steroid, so a, a, a nasal spray um, that would be a steroid that could maybe decrease inflammation. You can do often, there's a bunch of different types that you can use. A lot of them are by prescription, but we prescribe them to many of our patients. Um, basically a, a nasal steroid uh, in each nostril, um, and then trying to minimize the flow rate maybe of um, turning it down to the lowest flow that you need. Uh, but otherwise I'm not sure what else we would do. Something for dry nose or when people are getting um, you know, nosebleeds from it, we'll, we'll recommend using something called Sicaris gel to try to keep the inside of the nares moist so that they don't dry, dry out and crack and people get nosebleeds. But for the runny nose, I'm not sure if there's, I don't know what would be effective, but I would certainly try, try a nasal steroid and see if that might help. Okay. Well, thank you very much, Dr. Johansson. This has been a very informative and enlightening session, and, and uh, there's quite a few uh, folks who are very anxious about this. So hopefully, uh, maybe future dates, um, CPFF would be able to ask you to come back and do sort of a, a, another live webinar to uh, talk about some of those studies that you had mentioned um, that were you know, taking place and some of the guidelines that are coming out, because that would be very exciting for the people on today to learn more about. That would be fantastic. And I think maybe we could have a joint session uh, with somebody from an oxygen provider or with a respiratory therapist um, to help address some of those questions too that are, that are sort of technical and logistic about the oxygen delivery systems because they are such an incredible resource. Great. And we will do that. And this Wednesday, we're having a social gathering, uh, as we always do every Wednesday for, for this whole month for, at 4 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. And if anybody would like us to, we could always invite Dr. Carrie Johansson to come back and maybe answer some more questions if people have. And also don't forget to uh, you know, fill out our poll when you exit our webinar today, because it really helps us to make sure that we bring in uh, great sessions that you're looking for. And to also to help our um, ILD respirologists to see where the interests lie, because a lot of them are researchers as well, and they would welcome some of these topics. So I thank you very look, much. I look really casual, but I want to show everybody I'm wearing my Kiss IPF Goodbye t-shirt. Yay! <laughs> <laughs> it's great. Thank you so much, Dr. Carrie oh, Johansson. Thank okay. you so much. Thank you, everyone, for joining us. And don't forget to fill out the poll today. And don't forget to our, our Play to Win Challenge. we got great prizes every week. Thank you so much. Take care. Mm -hmm.